everyone. I'm Rachel Poli here with Ari Meglin, and we're your hosts for the Merry Writer podcast. We're on episode 96, and this week's question is, what are some writing advice from big authors? Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening so you never miss a show. And if you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like, write a review, and share it with friends. It really helps us grow. So for this week, we decided to look up writing advice from big name authors, and we figured we'll talk about whether we agree with this writing advice or not, because we totally are qualified to discuss this. So I'm just going to jump right in and say my first quote is, forget the books you want to write. Think only of the book you are writing. And that is by Henry Miller. I, I chose this quote because I thought it was really funny because from my interpretation of it, it's saying, you know, you have a million ideas and you want to write all of these stories, but forget all of those ideas. Whatever book you're currently working on, work on it, finish it, and then you can move on to other stories. And I just thought it was funny because I do agree with him to a certain extent, but we talk so much about how we have all these different story ideas and we can't choose between them and we'll start writing one and then we get sick of it or we get bored or we get burnt out. So we start writing another book and then we get into that for a little while, for a couple of months, and then We get bored of that one as well. And then we move on to a third idea. And then before you know it, you have all these unfinished novels and you don't know what to do with any of them because you feel like you made progress, but you really didn't make progress. So I do agree with him. I feel like once you start a project, you should stick with it and you should complete it. But then on the other hand, it is very easy to get burnt out. It's easy to get writer's block. And yes, there are ways to push past that. But I think one of those ways to push past that is to write other ideas. And sometimes your brain needs a break from one creative project so you can do something else for a little bit. And then maybe inspiration from that second project can help you get back to the previous project. I have to say, I don't like the fact that I'm being called out right at the beginning of this episode. Rude. Rude. Blame Henry. (laughs) I mean, Henry, we don't need this kind of crap. <laughs> because I'll be honest, I, I am awful for constantly writing something else. I have done that most of my life as a writer. I just, I, I completely plot hop from book to book to book to book to book. And it's rubbish because it never gets finished. Um, so yeah, I, I do agree with what he says. And I am so trying to do that. I have been mostly good at sticking to one story-ish recently but it's so hard to not just have that shiny object syndrome it's like shiny plot syndrome like ooh, new story and then you just you know you drift off it's like little kids in a, in a shop where they see something else they want to have and they just wander off that's what we're always doing but yeah it, it, it is good advice because if you try and write everything you will write nothing as we can confirmed with our many many half finished manuscripts but I do agree with Rachel if you're having a tough time with writer's block it is sometimes good to reset and and just sort of write something else it's better if you can kind of do a mini story or just do like a writing exercise but we're rubbish at that and we almost always fall for another plot and then get swept up in it but yeah god damn it Henry I need to try that. I will try that better. <laughs> I mean, it depends on your mood and stuff too. Like, like for me, I write in a couple of different genres and I write short stories and things like that. So some days I don't feel like working on my novel. I want to work on a short story. Sometimes I don't feel like writing mystery. I want to try to write a superhero story or something like that. So yeah, I, I get what he's saying and I do agree with him, but I'm not good at it. And I don't know if I ever will be good at it. No, but I think I think the fact that we have so many stories that are not finished, not even not published, not finished, doesn't make us realize that this quote this quote is quite poignant. So yeah. Uh, we will be better, won't we, Rachel? We will be better. Maybe. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip it a little bit with my quote. So my first quote is, 
Remember that sooner or later, before it ever reaches perfection, you will have to let it go and move on and start to write the next thing. Perfection is like chasing the horizon. Keep moving. And that is by Neil Gaiman. And that's another one of those quotes that makes you feel cold now. Because I have to admit, the number of, of, of stories I have where I just keep editing and editing and editing and then rewriting and then adding in new characters that probably didn't need to be added in and changing something and, and to the point until the point where the whole story is something completely different to what it began with and probably wasn't any better than what it was when it was originally written. But I think that's a, that's a big writer issue where we just struggle to let go. And I think part of that comes from fear. It's like, you know how you procrastinate because of fear? You sort of put all these obstacles in. I can't write. I've got laundry to do. I've got taxes to do. I have to go and dust the trees. You know, whatever you really use to procrastinate with. It's a type of fear to stop you from writing because maybe you're doubting yourself. Maybe you really don't want to deal with that ugly plot hole or that sagging middle syndrome or anything like that. And I think the opposite of that is the obsessive edit, the obsessive rewrite, where you just keep messing with a story over and over again. And I think this quote is perfect for that because it just kind of let you know that there is no perfect. I mean, we've talked about it before and other, other writers tell you about it, how when you've finished your drafts, you edit, you edit, you edit, you polish, and you make it as brilliant as it can be. But it's never perfect. And I think the problem is we hear the word polish and we hear the word, you know, make it clean and ready. And we think, well, that's some sort of like nebulous ending that you're never going to actually reach because it's never going to be that polished because it never feels that polished. But that's the point. You have to let it go. You know? This is upsetting me just thinking about it. Well, now it's my turn to feel called out because I've been working on my mystery story since 2011. And yeah, it's true. I can't even begin to tell you how many drafts of that book that I have because I've written it and then I rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it. And it is vastly different from how it started. And I will admit that I do think it is way better. Than when it originally started but yeah I don't I don't know I, I get to a point whenever I during my rewrites I get very close to the end and I only need to add maybe one or two more chapters to completely wrap it up and then I just stop and I'm you know I don't know I think part of it it's not even necessarily that we want perfection I think part of it is that we just can't let it go, especially when you've been working with certain characters for so many years or so long and you really enjoy your book. It's kind of bittersweet to publish it and, you know, just let it go. And then also if you have and then there is the fear factor of people reviewing it and then not liking it and not everybody is going to like your work doesn't mean anything you did. It's just everybody's tastes are different. But it's like, those are your babies. So you don't want anybody to not like them. And that, yeah. So, yeah, I, I get that. And I, I, I agree with Neil on this one. You, you do need to just let go what you're working on and move on and start writing the next thing. But that's easier said than done. So then you just said really sort of like hit hard. And it's like when you said you wrote and then you just stopped. And I think... I, I do that, but obviously not in the same way as you because I don't write linearly. It's all, you know, clunky, chunky scenes just thrown together to make a really messy jigsaw. And I think what happens to me is I get to a point and then I will watch too many movies or I will read too many books and then I'll be like, oh my God, they've got such stronger plots. They've got way more twists than my book's got. I need to rewrite it again, or I need to make it really intense. And even though I have read some brilliant books that were shorter, that had very simple arcs, and that are brilliant books, for some reason, I get hooked on the, you know, like, oh my God, it's got to have like layer upon layer and depth of, of like, wow, I didn't see that coming. And it's like, it doesn't need that. But I can't seem to, to unwind the necessity of making the book overly complex and complicated and like shocking the reader constantly. And I don't even think that's necessary because I actually hate reading books where it's so obsessive, where you don't even get a breath 
you know it's like chapter after chapter after chapter it's just this like oh my god every time you get a bit overwhelmed out if you will and yet I'm constantly trying to write stories like that and I don't even know why I'm just as I'm saying this I'm having a bit of an epiphany and it's kind of giving me a bit of anxiety of how stupid I've been wow wow no yeah. it's it's the imposter syndrome. It's like, wow, people really like this TV show. People really like this book. It's super popular. This is what my writing needs to be like. But what we need to understand is that every writing style is different. There are no, no books that are the same. You could have the exact same plot and give it to two different writers and they will turn out vastly different. And people will still enjoy it. There will be people that don't, like I said, because everybody's tastes are different, but people will, there are still people that will enjoy it. That's actually really clear because I mean we've talked about this before. Fairy tale retellings are so popular. Yeah. In fact, retellings in general are so popular. And yeah, if you think about those stories, they're pretty basic. You know, you take um, oh god, all fairy tales have got out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a minute. Let me think. Of, oh, right. <laughs> Beauty and the Beast is the one I can always. Remember. Beauty and the Beast. So you know, woman who's who's living her life very isolated and people don't understand her ends up you know locked in a castle with some monstrous beast they butt heads a bit you know and then she has to see beyond the blah blah all, all that rubbish and it's a very basic plot it's got a bit of romance in it it's got a bit of understanding and then you know you're like who is really the beast you know is it the monster or is it the people who don't understand who try and kill him you know it's a little mm -hmm. bit of that but technically it's a really basic storyline and yet there are dozens of books, probably way more than dozens. Well, there are hundreds of books and movies that have taken elements of that or redone those fairy tales. And they are, so, I mean, I'm actually thinking of some now, thinking they were so good stories. I really love them. And they weren't really complicated. So what the friggin' hell am I doing trying to overcomplicate my stories? And I don't think I'm that good at that. I don't think it would work well. I think I'd make it more convoluted and uncomfortable for the reader. So, yeah. Rachel, what the frick am I doing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> God, did not expect this from this episode. I know, really. We're learning a lot. I did say we're probably not qualified <laughs> to talk about all of these uh, writing yeah. advice. So, <laughs> you're welcome, everybody. <laughs> if you're still listening this far, who knows? But you know what? I'm actually going to go right ahead into my next quote because, Ari, you were saying that, like, you know, you'll start writing and you'll read books or watch TV shows. And then you get like inspiration to be like, oh, I need to write my story like that and stuff. So my quote, my next one is, if you don't have the time to read, you don't have the time or the tools to write. Simple as that. And I'm pretty sure everybody knows that's a quote from Stephen King. And I'm going to go ahead and throw out a totally unpopular opinion here and say that I do not agree with that quote at all. I do think that reading, like reading any book, reading in your genre, reading novels, reading, uh, writing craft books or just anything, it does help in the long run. It does boost your vocabulary. It helps you get, you know, it increases your reading speed and all that stuff. You do learn stuff from it, but I don't think you necessarily need to be a reader in order to be a writer because there are plenty of other ways that you can learn to write. And I think writing, the best way to learn about writing is to write, and it's all experience. You can write about what you know, you can write about what you don't know and do research on the internet. You don't necessarily need to read other novels and read uh, within your genre to be good at your own writing. Because again, you just end up comparing yourself to those other authors. And then you end up feeling bad and then you stop writing for a couple of months. And then when you finally get back to it, you get this little high and then you rinse and repeat the same thing over and over again. And I also say this because I had this conversation with a fellow writer like many years ago and she asked me if I thought that writers needed to be readers. And I told her no, because I didn't start reading until I was in college. When I, I, like, I was not a reader at all. I hated reading. Well, I didn't hate reading, but I had to read, you know, you read novels for school for homework and I didn't care about those novels because 
at that time, the teachers thought they were important reads, but at the age being in middle school or being in high school, like I wasn't old enough to understand the material. I wasn't old enough to appreciate the material. So I just didn't like reading. I thought all books were like that and I just didn't want to bother. And it wasn't until college that I really got into reading because I had more time to read for myself and read books that I found enjoyable and I was able to find what I liked. I didn't have to go ahead and read all the, you know, classics that you have to read for school and analyze them. I could just read them and enjoy them. And but I had been writing since I was 10 years old. And at that point, I'd like to say I was a decent writer, not to toot my own horn, but I had so much practice for writing way. Like, I think I've written more than I've ever read. That didn't make sense. I've written more books than I've read books. That was the same thing. I just reworded it. <laughs> I, I can understand where you're coming from. And as someone who actually struggled um, to read for quite a lot of uh, my school life, it was like I, I was really bad at reading and taking things in. Um, and I don't even have the ability of saying I was dyslexic because I was not and I am not. But I just um, struggled right up into high school. But I have to admit, the stuff they make you read in school is always so trite. It's always. I mean, if it's not Shakespeare, which I'm sorry, I think reading Shakespeare is so dumb unless you are learning script writing. Shakespeare is plays and you should watch the play because when I started watching those plays it made so much more impact it was so much more impactful in my life and and how I viewed them than reading this dry awful stuff on a page that made no sense whereas it when you've got a, a play in front of you you've got the context and the visual and yeah so I, I digress anyway but that's that's thing. And then there were some other ones like um, just oh, I can't even think of some really bad, bad ones. It was like far from the madding crowd. I remember reading that awful, awful book and hating everything about it and that author and everything about him and his life because he wrote that <laughs> awful book. <laughs> just the deep seated hate of that guy. I think it was Thomas Hardy. Oh, crap book. Crap. Do you ever read Animal Farm? I did. I actually do like Animal Farm. See, I to when I read it <laughs> in school, I hated it. And I don't know if I will ever reread that book because I have gone back to uh, books that I had to read in high school and middle school and I've reread them. And once I was like in my 20s, I was like, OK, I can appreciate this. I understand why they made us read this in school. I understand like the underlying, you know, racism aspect of it and things like that. Like I get it now. But when you're in school and it has to be for homework, like you don't, you don't care. No, they don't, ex they don't go through it. Well, you don't, you miss a lot of the, of the symbolism and even yeah. like little things that are more subtle. You miss them when you're younger and teachers are rubbish at sort of like pointing that stuff out. And again, they always give you their interpretation and a lot of books, there's different levels of interpretation, especially by depending on who you are reading it. It can have an effect depending, you know, it's like one person reading it with certain, um, one person reading it with certain experiences will we'll see and read something slightly different in it than another person and their experiences. So it's even that can have an effect. But yeah, those sorts of books, brilliant when you're older, when you've got a more un, a deeper understanding of, of the context. But yeah. However, I do think that reading can be quite useful for writers, especially if you're reading genres that you want to write or you're just starting to write. Because I find reading books similar to that is good for deconstruction I, I I think I did better with my writing when I started to deconstruct books that I read that I liked that were in the same genre as me just trying to break down how they brought things about how the plot was working how they worked in their arcs especially like their subplots and things and I found the more I read the more it was easier to deconstruct stories but as you said on the same vein reading a lot can influence you and it's not always a positive thing I mean it's like yeah you read you read and you it's it, it does help it can help you I should say it can help you find your voice and it can help you find um, a nice mix of how you describe 
sorry, a nice mix of creating descriptive prose with strong dialogue. However, the flip side of that is you could end up imitating someone else's voice and not finding your own voice if you're not careful, especially if you like bulk read one or two authors only. It can, as I mentioned earlier, affect your affect how you see your own writing to the point where you, you start doubting whether your writing is strong enough. And maybe that is a good thing. Maybe it does make you think, actually, maybe it's, it's not strong enough. But if it's like me, you could take a, a probably perfectly good plot and hack at it, trying to make it more complex, more detailed, more layered, and just coming out with a big ass mess when I probably should have just left it as it was. I've been okay with that. So yeah, I, I can understand it's like, I know there's people out there who, who write and they write very well and they don't read much because they could be dyslexic. They could struggle to enjoy a lot of the books. And sometimes you might like to write things. You're not actually as interested in reading. I know it sounds really weird, but I have met people like that. They enjoyed the process of the writing of that story, but they don't actually enjoy the genre, which is odd. I have to say it's a little, I, I personally can't get my head around that, but yeah it's out there yeah no i know what you mean i can't wrap my head around it either um but i i agree with you i do think that like you know reading books and reading uh craft books and stuff it does help you in the long run but i don't think you have to be a reader in order to be a writer because like for me personally i started writing mystery before i started reading mystery books and like my sister and I, we went to Barnes Noble every Saturday pre-COVID to write, and we would just write random stuff. We would write short stories, we would give our, each other a prompt, and we would just roll with it. And there was one day I decided, um, um, actually, I think my sister told me to write a mystery story, and I ended up basing the character George off of the Pink Panther, and that's how it started. And from there i realized that i really enjoy writing mystery so i decided to give mystery books a try but i didn't start reading cozy mysteries because i wanted to get better at writing my mystery story which sounds a little arrogant like that's not me saying that all oh, my mystery story is already perfect and it's like glorious i don't need to read other mystery books to improve that's not what i'm saying at all i'm just I, I enjoy the way that I write my mystery novels. So that's what I roll with. And that's probably why it's not published yet. Because if we go back to Neil's quote, then, you know, <laughs> it's, it's all full circle. I feel like we're punishing ourselves with these quotes. <laughs> we totally are. I know we should probably just end it right now. Podcast is over. <laughs> no, no, I, I have another quote which is oh goody uh, it's also a bit of a call out. <laughs> no, no of course it is it's, it's actually an interesting one because of because of how i write so i'll get to the quote uh, okay <coughs> there is a phrase i use called the valley full of clouds writing a novel is as if you are going off on a journey across a valley the valley is full of mist but you can see the tops of a tree here and the top of another tree over there. And with any look, you can see the other side of the valley, but you cannot see down into the mist. Nevertheless, you head for the first tree. And that is a quote by Sir Terry Pratchett. And we all love him. So, you know, that's that's good, even though a little bit stressful is that quote. So that is obviously a quote about planning. And if you know anything about Terry Pratchett, he was never a big planner. He would kind of do a loose plan and then obviously he did a lot of just writing he would just sit down and write and I think a lot of writers um sorry I think a lot of big authors are actually discovery writers where they sort of start with just writing basic scenes or chapters just to kind of get a feel of the characters and the worlds and everything and then they might start planning so this is kind of one of those quotes that talks about planning as you know as in the sense of are you a planner a pantser a planter and I'll be honest, I was always a, a pantser when I started writing. I had no plan at all. I would just start writing. But I'll be honest, I got stuff written. When I didn't plan at all, I got so much stuff written. It wasn't tied up nicely. <laughs> it wasn't finished. But I, I wrote so much when I was just pantsing. Then I started plotting. 
and I have written better, but I'm still not finishing as well. So now I, I kind of do a mix of the two, mostly because I get to the middle of the idea and a plot and I just give up. I almost always know my ending and I know my beginning. That middle section, I, I hate it with a vengeance. In fact, it's the, the two thirds of the way through. That's where it starts sagging. And as soon as I hit that roadblock, I just stop planning again and I just start writing. And so this quote is actually quite good for that because what so, so Terry is actually saying is kind of, you don't always need to know the minutiae of the story. You don't even need to see the path. You use the points on the graph, you know, the, the incited incident, if you know it, the next big, oh my gosh, moment. And obviously there'll be other little points between those two where it's something has happened, but they might not be as intense. And you don't always need to have those obviously plotted out. Now, I know there's going to be people listening to this who are freaking out either because they are full on pantsers and don't like any plotting ideas. And then there'll be full on plotters who are like aghast at the idea of not having everything written down. But I actually do think it's a good way to try. If you aren't big on plotting and you're not big on pantsing, I do think it's a good idea for, for both types of writers to try plantsing every now and then to have that discovery aspect within those stories but also have a bit of an idea of where you're going at least a couple of trees in the mist that you can see um but yeah it's, it's probably one of my favorite quotes of his because I kind of I, it does resonate with me I just need to be a bit better with it <laughs> I like that quote that is a really deep quote and I have to say, I find it funny that you're talking about, you know, you should try planting once in a while and things like that. Because I think in our second episode, like, you know, many, many moons ago, we did an episode about whether we're plotters, pantsers, or plantsers. And I believe I explained that I'm a plotter because I am. But over the years, I've, oh, I've always been a plotter. But over the years, I've started gravitating more so towards plantsing. And that seems to work really well for me now. Like I like having a general idea of where I'm going to go, but I've realized that outlines are more like guidelines. They're not like on the straight and narrow path. And you, I'm reading this quote and the way I interpret it is that you just need to go with it. Even it, like it's about the journey, not the destination in a way. And which is really funny because I'm sorry if I'm going somewhere and I can't see what's in front of me, like I'm turning around. I'm not going to like, I'm not going to press my luck here. But when it comes to writing, there are sometimes you just need to like, if you don't know where you're going next in the story, you need to trust your characters enough that they know where the next part of the story is. And you just need to go with it. You can't be like, okay, I don't know what the next scene is. Let me, you know, take a month off from my writing so I can think about it. You need to just keep on writing and, you know, throw your characters in any old situation and something will happen. I promise you. It may take a while. Like, for example, I'm pretty sure I've explained this before, but in my mystery novel, I have like five chapters where my characters do absolutely nothing. And it's pretty bad. They're all getting cut. But um, after like that fifth chapter, I had an idea and I was like, I finally see where this is going. <laughs> so it might take a while, but it will happen. I think that's it. When you said like about a guideline, I like to think of like the, the outline and the plot as being like a roadmap where yes, you have a start and yes, you have a destination, but you don't know if there's going to be some detours along the way. And that's kind of how I how I do my outline. I mean, I do an, an intense outline. I, I think my last outline was like 23,000 words, but it wasn't. I mean, people think that people hear that and go, oh, my God. But it's not like it was like really detailed. What it was was a bit of a mishmash of the points throughout the story that I wanted to obviously hit that were very, very important to the story to move it along. And then there were chunks of dialogue that I got while I was writing the outline or the odd question about something that I threw in there as well. And then sometimes the answer, sometimes I forget I'd even had that question until I got to it. And I kind of, so it's quite a big outline, but it was very messy and not strict. Now I have seen other writers where literally their, their entire outline 
is is point by point exactly what would be in the story and i know for some people that really works but i also think it is helpful to try a little bit of of plant singer just that discovery of where you might go i mean it might be that as you're writing because i know we find that something happens that makes you question the next step and you think actually would that really work i can feel it going in another direction and i think if you're so rigid to your outline you could end up going no no i'm going to stick to this outline and it might actually not be as good or it might make writing the sequel more difficult so I mean, like I had to change some of my outline because I figured out what book two was going to be like, and something that happened in book one was going to take me away from that, and I hadn't even it hadn't even dawned on me, which is another reason why you should kind of outline multiple books if you're writing series. Is um, I say that as I have not completed that option, so we're just going to skip past. That'll be an episode for another day. <laughs> yeah, but like if you think about who wrote this quote. I mean, Terry Pratchett has like, his catalogue is what, 70 plus books? And obviously, if you're thinking about like the Discworld set where characters, you know, come back through and he has this very vast world and the vast magical system within it that all has to interconnect and characters have to kind of meet up. And it's the idea that he doesn't plot really intently is actually kind of freaky. Um, but yeah, obviously, I feel like of all of you know, of all the people, um, ugh, I feel like of all the authors and advice I read, anything that he has said has always been like pure gold because you can't get past the fact that his catalog is immense and his world is his worlds. Mm. I should say because it's more than just the this world are immense and yeah, gotta admit the guy knew his stuff. But, but yeah, I, just, I cannot believe he didn't plot more deeply. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, though, it's kind of like a video game where the game is programmed for you to go from point A to point B. But over there, there's a treasure chest. And you know that you got to save the princess in that castle. But treasure. So you're going to go get the treasure first. And the princess can wait. She's fine. Like you know you you play in a video game it's like it's the same thing with your characters when you're writing a novel like if they're on a journey and they need to complete something or make it to a certain destination they're not just gonna like walk through the forest all hunky-dory and get there within a day or two like things are gonna happen things are gonna you know come up and they're not gonna be able to reach their destination on time or they're going to get derailed, or as Ari said, there's going to be a detour somewhere, and you just got to, you got to roll with it. So yeah, that, that's a good one. I like that. I actually love your idea of, um, like, think of it like a video game, because that's actually really clever, because yeah, there's, there's always extra little bits that you're not expecting, or like, you know, the secret level where you actually have to fall down a hole, and it's not a death. It's like, oh my gosh, look, I can find all these extra coins. You can tell I've gone like, straight back, straight to the old platform games. You know? Yeah, oh, rings in, in Sonic, yay! Uh, <laughs> I am not a gamer like most. I, I am very retro in my gaming, and it's very slow, and I don't do it very often. So this is as much as you're going to get from me regarding <laughs> gaming. But I do like that. How you know you might you might think, yeah, I've got to get, I've got to get from A to B to C to D. But then there's all these little offshoots, and I think that's what what it's like with writing. It's like your main plot is your A to B to C to D, hopefully. But then you know your subplots might have stronger links than you thought, and yeah, it's yeah. I, I do think I do think everyone should try, if not pantsing but planting. Whether you're one or the other, I think you should try it. I mean, I've heard pantsers say that uh, any time, any form of plotting is too restrictive. And I've heard plotters say that any form of pantsing just is sort of like wildly takes you out of the way and, and it's messy and it's harder to pull you back to the, the story arc. And that, and it's like, I don't know, I think, I think you should always try everything because who, how do you know which is the best way for you unless you try them all? Right, exactly. Yeah, you have to do a little bit of trial and error to figure out what the best way of writing for you is. Ours is apparently not writing enough or finishing. <laughs> that seems to be our way. <laughs> yeah. On that note, thanks guys for listening. <laughs>
we'll see ourselves out now. <laughs> so, you know what, there, there you have it. There's a couple of quotes from some big name authors that we may or may not agree with, or we agree with to a certain extent. But in the, in the end, you, we write however we want to write, and you have to find your own style and just roll with it. So now we'll turn it over to you guys. Do you guys have any favorite writing advice you'd like to share? Or maybe some least favorite writing advice you'd like to share? We'd love to chat about it. So tell us your answers in the comments below. And if you want some more of the Merry Writer podcast, then be sure to follow us on Podbean, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And for as little as $1 a month, you can join us on patreon.com slash the Merry Writer podcast for bonus content. It helps keep the show going. So we really appreciate the support. But in the meantime, tune in every Wednesday for a new episode of the Merry Writer podcast, where we ask all the right questions. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. This podcast is brought to you by Arguments Over Coffee and Tea. Which side are you on? Coffee. The music titled Inspired is by Kevin McLeod, licensed under Creative Commons 4.0.